speaker is Gerard Moreau, winner of the Nobel Prize uh, in 2018 for physics, obviously, together with Donna Strickland and Arthur Ashkin for his research in laser physics. Gerard spent about 30 years in the United States, and notably at the universities of Michigan and Rochester, before returning to France, where he is, he is professor at the Ecole Polytechnique and also director of the International Center for Zetawatt Exawatt Science and Technology there. He played a major role in building up numerous research centers on ultra-fast phenomena and high-energy, high-intensity lasers, both in the United States and Europe. <clears throat> Gerard is particularly well known for developing, together with Strickland, the triple amplification of laser light, which allows to reach petawatt intensities. This, in turn, opened the door to study many other physical and chemical phenomena. He has made major contribu uh, contributions also in the fields of electronics, optoelectronics, archaeology, and medicine. In particular, his work on the cornea resulted in the intralasic technology from which about five million people or patients have been benefiting. The impact of his contributions to science and technology has been duly recognized by numerous prizes and awards apart from the Nobel. Let me just mention here that he received the title Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur in 2012. Enough said, please, we'd like to hear your talk. Do now? Wow, much better. Huh? <laughs> okay, well, it's a, it's a great honor to be here, you know, famous place. And uh, in fact, I'm not very far from me. I was born in Albertville, you know, so uh, I'm quite familiar with uh, this area. And so I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, um, what really uh, gave me the. Op the um, the Nobel Prize, and it's about my passion for, uh, for extreme light. So I'm going to talk to you about extreme light, which is really very high intensity laser, basically. Um, and uh, we, uh, this is, I received the Nobel Prize with, uh, with Donna Strickland, former student and PhD student, and what is remarkable is that uh, she got, she wrote her first paper, you know, uh, from her thesis, and she got a Nobel Prize from this. So it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know any, any example, you know, maybe De Broglie or something, some, something like that had, uh, had the same thing. But anyway, that was uh, her first paper, <laughs> was... was um, Nobel Prize, okay. Uh, anyway, so, but I'm going to talk to you about it and uh, about how you can produce this very high intensity laser and what, in the applications. And uh, uh, one of the very important applications, you may know, you know, is of course, you know, laser acceleration. Okay, so, uh, Let's see. So, of course, you know, everything started from this guy, Ted Mehman, you know. Ted Mehman was a, the, the, really the scientist who really first was really demonstrated coherent light, you know. Uh, of course, we had incoherent light for 14 billion years, but uh, only in 1960, you know, we were able really to produce coherent light and with laser, of course, and he was the first want to show that. And what is amazing now, I mean, the, uh, if you're using, you can use laser for a variety of things, and uh, before, you know, uh, the application of lasers was uh, limited to the atomic world, okay? And now with the fact, the EV world, okay? And now with the fact that we can really increase 
the intensity or the power of these uh, uh, lasers, uh, we can really go now to, to explore, you know, the world in a subatomic world, you know, in a T, up to a TV regime. We are not quite at the TV, but at G, very certainly we are. And uh, <clears throat> uh, so, I mean, just to give uh, you an idea, we are going to talk about lasers you know, at a petawatt level, okay? And uh, just um, a petawatt, you know, is a million times the gigawatt. You know, gigawatt is the power of a typical power plant, you know. So it's very respectable. It's also, it's also a thousand times uh, the power, the grid power, you know. And, uh, but <clears throat> what is remarkable is that we're co producing, of course, this power in an extremely short time and using very uh, relatively small amount of energy, you know, if you have one joule, if you can deliver one joule in one uh, femtosecond, 10 minus 15 seconds, well, you got, you got a petawatt. And, uh, and what is remarkable is the fact that this, this really very high peak power uh, lasers, you know, they don't have much applications in the military. And the reason is because uh, the power comes not from the energy, but from the pulse duration. Uh, <clears throat> so, of course, with now we can, uh, with this petawatt, if we can focus uh, petawatt uh, light over, you know, one micrometer size spot, you know, you can get, of course, a extremely large intensities and, uh, and get very, very phenomenal, you know, radiation pressure. And now, in fact, with these lasers, we are capable of producing uh, the, of course, the highest peak power the largest temperature, the largest pressure, the largest accelerations. And it's really universal, universal source of high energy particles and radiation. <coughs> and so now, um, uh, this is really a plot of the intensity as a function of years since 1960 where the laser was born, okay? This, on this axis, you have the intensity in watt per square centimeters, and this is the years. And so when the laser was invented by, demonstrated by Ted Memon, you know, the laser was at about a 10 to the 8 or so watt per square centimeters. Uh, <clears throat> it was, of course, by today's standard, very, not very uh, powerful, uh, but at that time, you know, it was, of course, much, much more powerful than any other uh, 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 <clears throat> source of radiation. So, uh, in the, that was 1960. Uh, very, um, uh, you know, in the next five years, that followed 1960 up to 1955, uh, some techniques, you know, called uh, Q-switching or mode locking were um, demonstrated, and very quickly uh, the laser uh, power went to uh, rapidly up to a, a point 10 to the 14 watt per square centimeter where it, it is 10 to the 14 watt is really the uh, in intensity basically where you can start to ionize about everything. Okay? And so you could do multi ionization but also uh, you can really do machining and um, there's a very important application of machining. It's for eye surgery, for instance, that we, we have demonstrated. So, uh, but, you know, when you reach 10 to the 14 uh, petawatt, uh, for 10 to 14 watts, I'm sorry, then uh, because we had these problems is at this level, you know, you can basically damage everything, you know, ionize it. Uh, then uh, we couldn't really, the, the peak power couldn't be increased. And uh, so we, for about uh, 20 years, until 1985, basically the <coughs> laser power was stagnant 
at, uh, at this level. And then we came up with this uh, technique with uh, Dana, uh, which is for chair pulse amplification. And it's, it's not like uh, certified public accounting, you know, when uh, you're in, uh, it's different. <laughs> and anyway, um, this is one of my students. You know, when I, when I chose uh, the, the, this acronym CPAs, you know, this is completely crazy because uh, this is certified public accounting is right because we're in a state, you know, you have always this CPA everywhere, you know. Um, <clears throat> So anyway, so at that time, so, so we were able right, to circumvent these problems of um, uh, breaking down materials, damaging materials, you know, uh, and, and then, um, you know, we were able now to, to go very quickly, I mean, I think uh, steadily, at least, uh, we increase the power, you know, to, to much now about at least 10 orders of magnitude. And so, of course, we are traversing uh, different regimes uh, that I will describe. Okay. Relativistic optics and then ultra relativistic optics because we are, we are going, we'll be able now to accelerate particles and so on. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's see. Yeah, so reason, as I said, that we we, could, we stayed at 10 to, the, this 10 to the 14 watt or so per square centimeter limit intensity was, was because um, if you have a laser, that's a transverse profile of a laser beam, if you have a, 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 a beam which some, you know, um, uh, small um, uh, variations, special variation, these this special variations are going to grow in the amplifiers. And the reason why it's growing is because the index of refraction at these intensities uh, it, um, becomes intensity dependent. Okay? So the, the, the intensity, the laser, the uh, index of refraction, you know, is a constant plus this, this, uh, this, this term, which is N2i, which of course linearly dependent with the intensity. So, and that is going to really to introduce, to, to, to amplify, help to amplify, magnify, you know, all these, these wiggles, you know, that you have on the beam. And these wiggles, you know, are going to translate into, are going to cause some um, filaments, hot spots, and you are going to burn your optics. And your very expensive optics, you know, because we are working with very, very, uh, of course, expensive optics. Uh, so, uh, so the idea to circumvent these problems, <coughs> we start with, uh, with an oscillator which is producing uh, these very short pulses, you know, typically 20, 30 femtoseconds. Of course, when we started with Donna, we, we started with single picoseconds, you know, but now we are 20 femtoseconds, 30 femtoseconds or so. This is about 10, 10 oscillations. You know, the, the period of light, you know, at this, you know, regime where we are, typically 800 nanometers, micron, uh, micrometers. Uh, well, I mean, you have about 10 oscillations, 10, 20 oscillations of light, okay? And uh, means you have a short, very short pulse, which means you have a very, very broad spectrum. Okay, and so you have a blue, you have a red, and so on. And so what we we instead of taking this pulse and trying to amplify directly through this amplifier here, well, what we did is we, uh, what we are doing is uh, uh, is really we are stretching the pulse. Okay, we are, we we can stretch the pulse with diffraction grating of prisms. Uh, and uh, so you can, uh, each, every color, every frequency can take a different path, okay? And so you can stretch the pulse by typically 100,000 a million times, okay? Of course, when we started with Donna, it was 100 times. And then after we refined the technique and we are now uh, 100,000 times, a million times. 
which means that you can really amplify the pulses by a million times better, extract the energy by a million times better. And, uh, and then, I mean, also uh, we have to note that um, when we stretch the pulse, okay, we conserve the spectrums because it's very, very important to conserve the spectrum because the spectrum is, is, is what's going to give us the pulse duration. So, and the energy as well, if you are really uh, choosing the right gratings and so on. So, uh, <clears throat> now we are going to, so, as I said, we stretch the pulse about 100,000 times, a million times, and so we decrease the in input intensity by, by, uh, by uh, 100,000 times, a million times. You amplify, you amplify this pulse, it's now much, much better, uh, you know, but uh, more, more, in fact, than six order of magnitude because you can use the fact that you are stretching the pulse, you, you can stretch it also specially, not only in times, but specially. And you end up with uh, something which is uh, very, which has been amplified by almost uh, 10 billion times. And here, you know, because I'm giving this public lecture, it's not exactly a public lecture here, because you're all expert in, in, in your physicist, and, but I, I always say that if this pulse, you know, is as a weight of a, of a fly, you know, then we amplify the pulse up to the, up to the weight of an elephant, you know, which is remarkable. And, 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 and I say, you know, this, what was the trick was, of course, um, you have to, to make all this complicated manipulation, you know, stretching by a million times, amplifying the pulse, uh, you know, large, uh, by a million times or so. And then you, you, and you, what you want is really the perfect pulse. That is, you want a pulse which really uh, <coughs> is very much like input pulse, but we, we, we cannot tolerate any, any pre-pulse. Okay, so if this pulse here is the Eiffel Tower, then we cannot really tolerate something higher than a few nanometers. Okay, uh, if we have a to higher than that, then uh, this very, um, <clears throat> this pre-pulse, you know, can really um, create a damage to the, <coughs> to the, um, the specimen, uh, the, the target, and, and so we are, we, <clears throat> we don't like that, of course. We like that to come. When the main pulse comes, he, he has to see a pristine, a pristine pulse. <coughs> Target. Okay, uh, so, uh, so now, of course, we, uh, what is um, very exciting is uh, um, we can amplify the pulses to very, very high intensities. I think I should really go back to, to um, uh, okay, uh, to this, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm coming back to this uh, my slide here, where you can see that we can really now amplify the pulses to very very high intensities. Right now, the highest intensities are in a range of 10 to the 23, 10 to the 24 watt per square centimeters. And we want ready to go to go uh, up again. We like ready to go uh, another <clears throat> another four, five, or six order of magnitude. Uh, the reason we want to do that is because we would like ready to study to study the, <clears throat> the interaction of light with vacuum. Okay, and uh, so you have to go the field of the <clears throat> of your um, laser has to be near the critical field, the Schwinger field, okay? So that means that we have to be around 10 to the 29, okay? But anyway, so, uh, so there's a lot of things uh, to be done before the 10 to the 29 is what we are, going, what, what we are doing is what I'm going to, to tell you. Um, so, um, So there is very, very, uh, um, three very large scale infrastructure which has been, uh, which has been uh, built 
um, by the by the uh, Europe, you know, and uh, there is uh, they are in Czech Republic, in Hungary, in Romania. Each one have uh, petawatt lasers, you know, and uh, this infrastructure are open so people can go and do experiment on this infrastructure. They are not fully completed yet, but uh, they are very close to me. <coughs> okay. Now, if you, uh, of course, if we are in this regime, in a um, regime of less than 10 to the 18 watt per square centimeter, this is a regime where, um, but that's the type of regime that we, we study, you know, uh, up, and uh, where the, where the uh, optical field, uh, here is, uh, um, where the, uh, the field applied or the force applied to the electron is, is typically Q times E, okay, E being the electric, electric field. And uh, so, uh, so you have the electrons, you know, uh, are moving perpendicularly to the, prop, to, to the propagation directions. Now, of course, when we have when we are cranking up the field, you know, to about 10 to the 18 watt per square centimeters, things are changing because uh, this, you have at that time, of course, to take into account uh, uh, the, the magnetic field, okay? So you have to add this term V over C cross B, okay? Which means that now the electrons is not going to oscillate just perpendicularly to the propagation direction, but also it's going to oscillate, you know, longitudinally uh, uh, to the propagation direction. And of course, this is really going to be used for accelerations of uh, particle acceleration. And uh, so, and now, one thing, um, if we want really to accelerate particle with light, okay, you will see that we can do it very, very well, very efficiently, uh, because of a concept which was proposed by Tajima and Dawson in 1979, which is called the wake field acceleration. At that time, of course, they couldn't do it. They have to wait, but the CPA being invented. But with CPA, now we, have, we, we can really uh, accelerate particle. And the way we, it works, basically, is we are going to, uh, to, <clears throat> to create a plasma, you know, uh, with this very high intensity laser, it's very easy to create the plasma. And, and, and the, 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 um, the particles in this plasma are going to act like a surfer, and there will be, they will, the particles are going to surf through this plasma. And uh, so um, it is. Uh, so it is very simple to produce very high energy particles with our lasers. What you do is uh, you take the high intensity lasers, you know, uh, come from, come, coming from the center. So this terawatt, petawatt uh, laser, and you focus the beam. And uh, when you focus the beam, of course, you are going to uh, ionize and create a plasma, and so on this plasma, you are going to be, the electrons are going to be trapped, you know, in, in, in this, um, uh, the trough, I mean, the plasma wave, uh, they, are, they are going to be to surf, so to speak, and uh, so this is a laser pulse, okay, which is producing this plasma, and uh, all, all these particles are going to be dragged, um, behind um, uh, the laser pulse. And, but what is spectacular is you, you can really produce gradients, uh, extremely uh, high gradients of the order of a GeV per centimeter, okay? Uh, so this is very respectable, and uh, of course, this is a, that captures the attentions of the accelerator people course, and we are now, in fact, um, under this program, Apraxia, 
trying really to, to build uh, lasers and, and accelerators uh, based on laser wake field accelerations with really a uh, type of energy of 5 GV, 7 GV, but with good emittance and, and so on. But, I mean, GV per centimeter, of course, is enormous, okay? It's enormous. Uh, we know that um, uh, um, typical machines like a synchrotron machine and so on, you know, they are, they are hundreds of meters in dimension uh, for GV, for GV uh, uh, energy, particle energy. And, of course, but they are much more than three centimeters, okay? So, uh, this is a type of um, collider right now, I mean, that we will like to build, you know, which is based on, on, on laser wake field, okay? Of course, you have, if you want to go to the TEV, uh, you are going to need, need many, many stages, and this is what we are studying now. Uh, now, if you really want to go higher, you know, we are... Uh, you know, you will say, yeah, 5 GeV is pretty good already, but there is ways to go much higher, okay? And um, one way to do it will be going to go into the single cycle regime. You have seen that now we have about 20 cycles, okay, in our pulses, and we like right to go to one, okay? And I will show you why. Uh, if you go to, uh, of course, if you go to from 20 to one, you are going to increase the peak power by, uh, by, 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 by 20, by the number of cycles. But you are going to increase the ponderomotive force, which is really pushing the, the, the particles by the square, by n square. Okay? So this is already a very significant uh, uh, effect. Um, and, uh, uh, but it's not that, you know, and then, um, so if we do, uh, we go to a single cycle regime, you will be able really to produce uh, this um, uh, uh, short pulse, but with this short pulse now, we will be able, able now to produce uh, pulses now in the X-ray gamma ray regime, in the attosecond and zeptosecond regime, okay? Um, and the reason we want to do that, of course, is, really, is in, in order to increase the power. You know, the power is energy by time. So now we are at the femtosecond laser uh, level. So if we go uh, to attosecond, we will, of course, we will increase the power by as much, you know, by a factor of 1,000. If you go to septosecond, of course, it's going to be much higher. So this is, this is really what we, what we want to do. But if we go to also to the septo, ato, septosecond uh, pulses, you also go in automatically, you know, just by Fourier, uh, you are going to go into the X-ray gamma ray regime, okay? This is what's so exciting. Plus, also, uh, with this uh, zeptosecond, well, with uh, this single cycle compression technique, we will be able really, really to go now in a TeV per centimeter, not GeV per centimeter, but TeV per centimeter. And we will be able really to produce relativistic protons in a very, very sh short time scale and do also all, all, all kind of. Uh, um, uh, um, we could study, you know, things that we can only, uh, you know, is occurring in space, okay. Uh, so, uh, in, so now, in order to compress the pulse from 20 femtoseconds, 20 optical cycle to one, say, uh, what we are going to do is, uh, because the pulse is of 20 femtoseconds, the reason is because it's limited by the bandwidth, by the gain bandwidth of the medium, okay? So, and we stop at 20 femtoseconds, we cannot go, we cannot go uh, uh, shorter than that. 
And so uh, what we do is we have to broaden the bandwidth, okay? And the way we do that is by self-phase modulations. And again, we are going to use the fact that the index of refraction is a function, linear function of the intensity. And so if the intensity, you know, varies, of course it's a pulse, you know, very short pulse, varies, which means that uh, you are going to change the phase in a very short times, which means you are going to produce frequencies, okay, new frequencies. And um, so that works very, very well. Uh, so this is uh, what we want to do, you know, we want to take a pulse which is about 10 times a second and compress it to a single cycle. And uh, so what we do, we take uh, one of these lasers, you know, that's a petawatt laser. Uh, and uh, uh, the petawatt laser has this nice property to have the beam as a flat top. Okay, which means the beam is basically uh, uniform. It's not a Gaussian beam, it's uniform, okay? And so what we are going to use that to our advantage. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, a little bit of a story about pulse compressions. The technology was redeveloped at uh, 1985. 1985, people use optical fibers. Um, and uh, because the pulse was uh, Gaussian, so you had to, you had to use a, a guiding system, you know, to, to, and, and because you had fibers very, very long, so it was easy, really, to produce a lot of uh, self-phase modulations. Um, even though, I mean, the pulses were very weak. I mean, it was, they were in a nanojoule regime, okay? So we could produce single cycle pulse in a nanosecond regime. And, um, but of course, nanojoules, um, sorry, nanojoule regime, nanojoule <coughs> was not sufficient. Uh, and um, uh, we, uh, Svelto from, uh, and Krauss, uh, uh, demonstrated um, uh, that we could really use now, uh, instead of using fibers, we could use capillaries, you know, which was, uh, so it was, uh, we, <clears throat> it was easier to produce, to adapt, I mean, to accommodate more energy, okay. Then, uh, so we, now we could, so we could uh, uh, produce single cycle pulses or quasi single cycle pulses at a millijoule level, okay. And, <clears throat> and uh, but now, you know, it's, we found that it's not easy, it's not sufficient. Uh, we like to have much more. And so we like to compress these 20 uh, femtosecond pulse which are produced by these large scale systems. And uh, so uh, in order to do that, we invented a te technique which is which is using the fact that uh, uh, the, the, uh, this beam of these large scale lasers are top hat, okay? So if they are top hat, that means we can really now uh, produce surface modulations across, across the beam, you know? And, uh, and now we could, if we can compress the pulse because if the surface modulation is really uniform, so we can compress the beam now by using uh, what we call, you know, chirp mirrors and uh, in order to get into the single cycle. And what this is what we are doing. Um, <clears throat> here we are. So we start with uh, uh, a top pad beam, you know, about 25 m per second, and we go into this uh, film a very thin films, you know, uh, where um, so the, the beam can see, you know, uniform, you know, over 2D, and we have uniform um, uh, uh, thickness, and, and then we produce our surface modulations and, and, and so on. And we are using a double stage, uh, 
And after a double stage, we can show uh, that we could get into uh, uh, we could get into a single cycle. In fact, we have not really demonstrated that, but we have demonstrated single single stage. So we get we go into a sub 10 femtoseconds, and then we go into a second stage where we'll be able now to get single cycle. But now this single cycle, you know, as 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 um, 10 joules of energy, which is enormous for, for us, okay? Because the field of ultrafast, usually, you know, uh, you are dealing with mini joules, you know, micro joules, mini joules, uh, joule at the limit, but here we are talking about 10 joules and so on. So it's, um, uh, it's very exciting, the possibility to do that. And, uh, and, and one thing that we can do once we have these high intensities with very short pulses with a lot of energy, which means a lot of peak power, a lot of intensity, we can fo focus the beam over one lambda, you know, because what we can do is they're still invisible. I mean, the components of these pulses are invisible. We can focus on over one lambda, so you have a single pulse, and then, uh, of course, the, 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 the light pressure is going really to push the, the electrons uh, of, of the specimen, whatever it is. I mean, we can take, uh, we can take uh, um, uh, glass, we have plastics, metals, whatever. But over, <coughs> it has to be good quality, of course. But uh, we can really push now the electron, you know, forward. And, and, and the ions, of course, are dragging be, be behind because they are so, so massive. And so, uh, in, in a way, we, what, we are, what we are doing is we are, yeah, okay, so the pulse now is pushing the electrons and leaving the, um, the ion beyond. So you are really um, producing a very huge, huge, uh, big displacement, which is going really to produce a, a huge quasi, you know electric field, and this quasi-electric field is going to bring back the electrons uh, in this direction, but going to bring back the electrons, but at the speed of light. Okay, very, very large. With Lorentz factors, we have simulated about 1,000 times. Okay. And so now if you have this uh, single, uh, if you have light, you know, uh, in, you know, this light is in, impinging on, on this specimen, uh, going at the speed of light, of course. And the, the, the light which is reflected by this moving mirror is asked to go at the speed of light. So you can find, you can really convince yourself that you are going to compress the pulse. And the compression that you can get is, uh, should be of the order of the Lorentz um, factor. Uh, so this is the pulse after compression, you know, going. And uh, the pulse now is very, very thin, you know, is if we say that you compress by a factor of 1,000, you know, um, the femtosecond pulse, you are in the attosecond regime. Uh, so this is really the pulse durations, pulse durations uh, in the attoseconds. Uh, in attosecond, and this is a field, laser field, uh, and <coughs> normalized vector potential. Uh, so at 1 is 10 to the 18 watt, at 10 is 10 to the 20, at 100 is 10 to the 22, and so on. And you can, and the, the pulse duration that you can get after, after compression is 600 over A naught. As I said, it's about it's in the after second regime. Even if you are pushing, if you are pushing in the simulations, you can go into the zepto second regime. You know, this is a single zepto second regime. Of course, if if we get into the hundred zepto second regime, we'd we'll be happy. So, <clears throat> so what we have done, in fact, is really we have produced a coherent, coherent X-ray gamma ray pulse. With a phenomenal uh, peak power, okay. So this, of course, it is um, is extremely important for 
some applications that I'm going to discuss. So, as I said, the zeptosegon, this zeptosegon pulse, you know, which is in uh, 10 to the minus 21 four uh, 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 second um, range, you know, uh, if you have only one joule, uh, and that will, because we have, from our laser, we, we have 100 joules or so. So even if you have, you have only one joule between the zeta second, you have a zeta watt system, okay? Which, of course, is enormous. Uh, also, uh, we will be able, really, with this very short pulse and very high intensity, able to produce, uh, uh, to accelerate particles to the TeV per centimeter regime. Okay, uh, so over one centimeter, you could get a TeV. Um, and also, um, because we are very, now we are in the X-rays, of course, it's a difficult, difficult to focus the beam in the X-ray, but if you can do it even not completely, uh, you can really uh, reach, with the zeta watt pulse, you can reach the Schwinger intensity, you know, in order to, to study uh, vacuum and interaction of light and vacuum. Um, and you can turn matter in a, into um, light, I'm sorry, you can turn light into matter and antimatter. Okay. Uh, so this is, uh, of course, um, very exciting. Uh, so now, um, I, I, I mentioned, I, you know, I showed that we could accelerate particles we could accelerate particles using this, this weight field accelerations. But uh, the light that we were using, of course, were visible light. Okay? Now, the fact that we could have X-ray light, you know, very high peak power X-rays, um, now we can do, f not only we can uh, produce, we can produce a weight field acceleration in gases, but also in solid. And what is nice is the fact that, of course, this, these accelerations of um, fantastic accelerations, you know, is a function of the, the, the density of the electron density of the materials, you know, we are producing the, uh, the weight field. Um, and right now, because we were really producing the weight field in gases, and the, the gases, of course, uh, what we are using, a density of 10 to the 18 or so. Uh, so uh, we, it means that we, will, we, we, we could get into GV regime. Now, if we're really using solids uh, with 10 to the 24 uh, 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 electron per, per cubic centimeters, then, then you can really produce a TeV. So the fact that we can really produce now an X-ray pulse, short X-ray pulse, with high energy, then that opens the possibility to produce this phenomenal gradient. And um, so this is really something very, very important. Um, so uh, I'm not going, not going to go into the detail of this, but it's phenom I mean, it's really mind-boggling to think that now, over a crystal of one centimeter, we could really produce TeV particles. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> So, and uh, the, the, the material that we are going to use, of course, are going to be porous material, okay, like this, and so on. So, and we are working with, uh, with laboratories and so on, which are really, can produce this type of material. Uh, now, of course, you know, it's, but I don't want to be provocative here, okay. Just m mention that, of course, you know, if you are using uh, uh, microwave, you know, of course, uh, if you want to, to produce a TEV, you have, I mean, we are in the middle of it. Uh, we, can, we, can, we have to build something at 20, 20 kilometers uh, or so. Uh, if we are using um, 
weight field, uh, then we could reduce the size of accelerator by a large amount, you know, and have something like 100 meters. But I'm sorry to be provocative, okay? I, I know there is some, it's not as simple as that, but anyway, it's tempting to say that uh, if you are using this single cycle in the X-ray regime, then, of course, you could really produce CERN basically on the finger. Okay, I, <laughs> I, I realize that this uh, really, uh, it's, it's just, uh, I just want to, to, to just uh, be provocative a little bit. Um, okay, so, and, and you know, it's what, is, what is remarkable is the fact that, you know, uh, if, you, uh, if you consider that, you know, the field of uh, the accelerator started, started uh, with uh, things like uh, Van der Graaff, you know, uh, um, which are producing MEV uh, parti particle, they were basically DC machine, okay? And uh, now, in order to get more gradients, you had to go for, to the RF cavities at 10 to the 9 Earth and so on. And so, and, and now, if you want to go even higher, then you have to use light. Light where well, now you, go, you move from the 10 to the 9 hertz to the 10 to the 14, 15 hertz. And if you want to go even higher, well, you, you, you change, you go from the visible light to the X-ray light with 10 to the 18 hertz. So there is a logic behind all this. Uh, now, um, there is applications, of course. Of, um, and uh, I'm going to show you some of the applications. Um, I call that low-hanging fruit. One of the applications is, of course, uh, the production of very high energy protons, or relativistic protons. Uh, we know that, I mean, you, you know much better than me, uh, but it's very difficult to produce relativistic protons. But if we have this type of source, in fact, with high intensity, with this uh, extreme light, uh, it's very easy, okay? You have a very thin specimen, okay? And the thin, the thin, you are using this ultra high intensity light, and you are pushing the electrons, and the electrons are dragging the, 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 the protons or the ion behind, and you have, if the intensity is high enough, you have your, your relativistic particles. And uh, so this is, this is what, what happened, is you have the laser here, you know, single, single pulse laser here. And uh, this you have <coughs> very thin, thin, thin foil, nanometer thin, thickness foil. And uh, you are pushing the electrons are now produced and dragging <coughs> behind the protons. And you get this... Uh, you, you get these high, high energy protons. Uh, we, as a function of the intensity, it's also it's normal, normalized, uh, vector, normalized uh, quantities here. Yeah? <coughs> but and this is the energy, proton energy, you know, versus the field, the intensity. And uh, you see that if you have in, in the regime where we are right now, okay, uh, with pulses in the 20, 30 femtosecond pulses, uh, then we can really produce up to about 100, 100, ME, uh, 100 MeV uh, protons. Now, uh, if we really now, uh, and we are going to start to do the experiment, now really uh, uh, use only a few optical cycles, then we get more more intensities, and if you have one single cycle, then you get even more, more energy uh, in, 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 the, in, in the relativistic regime. Uh, plus, what is nice is the fact that if you have one single cycle, you don't have the instabilities which are produced by, 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 the, um, by the cycles, you know, uh, all these multiple cycles. 
which are producing instability. So you, are, you, have, you have some sort like a tsunami, you know, you have a short pulse coming, but before, before the tsunami, you know that uh, the water is very calm, you know, very steady. And now, uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, if you are, they are coming with one single pulse, then you immediately get very nice interactions. You have no, no, uh, no instabilities to spoil the beam. Okay, and of course there is, you know, that there is many, many applications now. If you are in a nuclear, um, um, nu nu um, uh, if you are producing this type of, of uh, of uh, particles like um, relativistic proton and so on, uh, then you know we have a very a large amount of of applications in medical in medicine. And and what this is very important because for in, for the Nobel Prize, you know, uh, I mean um, Alfred Nobel motto is really for the greatest benefit to humankind. Okay, so. Uh, it's important really to do basic science, but also it's important to uh, to demonstrate some really nice applications. And I think with single cycle uh, extreme light, we should be able really to produce very nice uh, uh, applications. Uh, this is the application which is very nice, of course, is the proton therapy. The fact that we have proton now, if you have protons in a hundred of MEVs, then you can really try, you can, uh, you can maybe compactify um, um, <coughs> proton therapy facilities, you know, uh, very much, make it, trying to make them cheaper. And so we, they can really, they can really be, um, be installed, you know, in many, many hospitals. Right now, you know, that it's very, they are very big, they are very expensive, and so on. So you have only few in France for instance. Uh, so that, that, of course, is a very, very important application. The other uh, important application also is it's really trying to treat the nuclear waste. Uh, we know that, I mean, we have this basic problem now, very important problems, which is, you know, um, <clears throat> how can, can we generate energy without destroying the planet, okay? And, uh, of course, you know, one, one solution would be really to use nuclear energy if you knew how to treat, uh, to treat the waste, okay? And, but if you can really fabricate, fabricate um, uh, protons, you know, and then if you pro pro uh, produce proton, high energy protons, you can, by spallation, produce neutrons, you can produce these neutrons, then you can really uh, uh, transmute. You can really fission some of the uh, elements, you know, big elements, right, like, uh, which are the most, the most uh, dangerous one. You know, there is basically these four elements which are really ba bad, uh, the neptunium, the curium, the americium, with really half, uh, half life of, uh, hundreds of thousand years, and of course this is really uh, a problem. Uh, and so, uh, but if you have neutrons like that, you know, we can, we could really, uh, you know, fission uh, the, uh, these elements and make a fission product with lifetime, uh, half-life of um, much, much shorter much shorter. And I, we talked with Donna Strickland about this, this possibility to the Pope, and he, he likes it. You know. So, uh, but we have to demonstrate this. Yeah. Uh, okay. And I think I'm going to stop here because this is about, I'm sorry, this is about orbital debris. Uh, and um, the orbital debris is not so, it's not so much about uh, extreme light, okay? Um, but anyway, I don't. So I'm going to stop here at this level now. Uh, and to conclude, we'll say that 
extreme light is capable of producing a very large field, very large acceleration, very, very large temperatures and pressures. And, uh, and, and, and really provide a way, you know, to, you know, really open the, open the world to really a number of potential applications for science and society. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Questions? Comments? You? You? Um, can you press uh, the microphone button? Uh, oh, yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, great presentation. Um, y you've been uh, speaking about uh, the uh, materialization of light at mm -hmm. uh, very high um, intensities. So I was wondering uh, what kind of matter have you observed uh, being created by these? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I missed what you said. Oh. Yeah, so I was talking about materialization on, 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 on of light or vacuums and so on. Uh, because, I mean, you are breaking down the vacuum. Yes. So you are producing particle and entire particles. Okay. With, with, with laser, with light. Yes. Okay. And uh, this is really, of course, unique. Yeah, it's great. So, so, mm -hmm. so I was wondering just, um, did, did you have any way of detecting what particles were produced or? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I don't think that is really a big problem. Or, you know, you are detecting positron electrons. Yes. You know, it's not, I don't think it's a big problem. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just press the button. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, mm. Could you tell us a little bit about Ally and its technological um, development, perhaps uh, the future of mm -hmm. high intensity light in Europe? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry, I went very fast. Okay. Uh, and uh, yes, we have these uh, three uh, majestic, I would say, infrastructure, laser infrastructure. As I say, Romania, Hungary, Czech, Czech Republic, and uh, each, each one uh, are really, they are not three times the same thing. They are, they are three uh, infrastructures which are really um, have um, some lasers, I mean, sometimes it's one, sometimes it's several, but always, you know, in very, very high, uh, uh, high power, you can produce very high peak power and so on. And, uh, um, and this, this, of course, this is because there's, there's, there's all this, it's really to do all this uh, facility physics, uh, but we, uh, and applications that we are talking about here, yeah. Basically, nuclear physics, high energy physics, and, and so on, yeah. There has been uh, a fourth uh, ally in discussion. And mm, you I mean the fourth pillar? Yes, yeah. super ally of... Uh, yeah, well, I, I think it's maybe uh, is going to appear in a different form. You know, when we were, when we thought about Eli and the fourth pillar, which means we wanted to produce, to build basically an exawatt system or a fraction of an exawatt system. Right now, you know, an exawatt is a thousand times a petawatt, okay? And the petawatt, you see the size of the facilities that we have to produce a petawatt is already uh, very, very expensive and complicated. Now, uh, maybe the fourth pillar will be equipped will be done with a single cycle pulse. Because single cycle pulse uh, will provide the exawatt, and even maybe the zeta watt pulse, without changing anything, but without using, using really the basic ingredients that you have in, in the facilities. Like, um, and, and the only things that we have to do is you have to compress the pulse to a single cycle, and after that, we can really use uh, relativistic mirrors, 
ready to compress the pulse even further. So first, you are in a visible, so you go from 20 femtol, 20 cycle into one cycle. Now you are using this one cycle, what we, we call that lambda cube regime, because all the light is in lambda cube. You know, it has the, the transverse dimensions is lambda, okay? And the longitudinal, longitudinal dimension is also lambda. So all the energy is, is, is a lambda cube. And so with that, we can really produce now a very, very short X-rays or gamma rays with a lot of energy because it's very, very efficient, very efficient mechanisms with a lot of energy. And so even, I mean, we could have, um, it's, it's coherent, okay? So basically, you, you are building a free electron laser, but with much more energy and much shorter pulses, and plus other applications. Mm. Yes? Uh, I don't understand your application to to macroscopic work, you see, in, for example, when you were discussing the question of transportation of nuclear waste. Yeah. You see, your power comes in terms of shortening the pulse, mm -hmm. but you are still using the lasers, which are the average power of the order of uh, 40 or 100 watts, you see. Yeah. Yeah. So then if you would like to uh, uh, transmute one gram of radioactive waste, you see, and but what is now? The, the energy here, here. Yeah, 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 yeah. And but what is, of course, what we, what we can produce now. But if we have, really, if we have to build, we will know how to build, say, a 100 kilowatt laser. In and fact, you from, a single, fi from a single fiber, a single fiber, you can get 100 kilo kilowatt. A single fiber. Okay? And so if you gang them up, if you take maybe a uh, hundred of the fiber, and this is what we have demonstrated, you know, you could get into the megawatt regime. But of course, when you do uh, basic research, you are not going to produce a megawatt. So what we are now, what we have demonstrated are the concept, okay, at the, at the laser level. And, and the, um, um, and we, because one of the problems is, of course, uh, the forte of lasers is not in the efficiency, okay? Usually, lasers are pretty bad in terms of efficiency. But if you are using fiber laser, is efficiency is much better, 30% or so, okay? And, and then you can also, with this laser, you can produce uh, a fiber laser, single fiber laser, you can produce 10 kilowatt, 100 kilowatt CW efficiently. But, this is still but now what we have to do it is to adapt it. We have to adapt it, you know, to these applications. But the, the technology is, is, is there. I mean, we need, of course, to adapt this, uh, this, uh, this technology to this application, of course, it's going to cost money, and uh, we will have to do some engineering. But I, I think it's, I, it looks good, I would say. Now, you, you cannot really use, you cannot take the numbers, uh, the characteristics that we have today, you know, for, for science applications, when you are, when you are building at universities, when you are building, uh, 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 you know, uh, lasers, you know, it's for science, for, you know. So, so the, of course, the average power is not, not there and, and so on. But um, I think we can, we can really produce very high average power if we need me. Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned proton therapy as an application of CPA. Mm -hmm. Can you develop more about what the status is? Is it currently being used in proton therapy, or is that a... No, no, no. I mean, the proton therapy exists yes, no. using conventional technology. So now, uh, but of course, they are enormous. 
Okay? So now you have the possibility to, do, uh, to produce these protons at, at the 100 MeV level, where you want, okay, with much more compact system. And, and I would say, certainly cheaper mm -hmm. system. And do you have an idea of the time frame of that kind of technology? Uh, I would say from 5 to 10. I mean, we're going to have, it's going to take maybe five years to demonstrate really to have a, a prototype, engineering prototype, and then after that, you, you know, you... Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I know, I think it, it, it's really looking really good. Mm -hmm. thank yes? There's one question. <clears throat> yeah. Sorry, I have two technical questions. The first mm -hmm. question is, uh, how much latency is expected in, latency was expected for the one petawatt laser cell? How much? Latency. Uh, frequency, uh, many uh, latency. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Latency for what? So, for the pulse per second. How many parts are expected? Ah, rep rate. Yes. Repetition yes. rate. Ah, well, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, it depends on the um, energy of each pulse. Okay. Typically, uh, as I said, because um, as you increase the rep rate, you increase the cost of the laser. Okay. So now, I mean, we are talking about uh, 10 Earths. And, but we are uh, working on, we have demonstrated kilohertz. Kilohertz. Kilohertz could be uh, certainly done. Uh, uh, and particularly uh, fibers, again, uh, could get um, into the megahertz. Okay, the second question is, uh, the, sorry. How, sta how much stability of the pulse? Pristine. Perfect. Pristine. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Mm. Okay. Jan, another question. I would like to return to laser fusion, uh, which is a topic uh, both in France and the US, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. has seen a lot of interest, and uh, I haven't seen a single word about fusion in your lecture. Can you yeah. comment? Well, I mean, you understand why. Because laser fusion is using long pulses you know, five, ten nanosecond pulse. We are using pulses which are a million times shorter. Okay? No, no, but, uh, that, no, I, uh, Jan, I'm, I, I'm with you. And uh, so, you, you know that one of the problems, one of the uh, schemes uh, uh, scheme was really to induce this, uh, this uh, uh, fusion by sending like a uh, I mean, laser fusion now works like a diesel engine, right? You are, we are compressing the fuel, which is in this small, small bubble, you know. We are compressing this fuel, and, and, and we try to self-ignite, the fuel self-ignite. Okay? To do that, you have to compress the fuel a thousand times uh, the uh, liquid density which is very, very difficult. So, it's, so uh, the idea is very much like a diesel engine and, and, and uh, of course, um, spark, plug, uh, spark plug engine, where you, are, you can reduce really the, the pressure, you know, in the chamber of, you know, uh, very much by, by putting a, 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 a light um, a spark plug. So now the, we try to do that, and I was not involved with this, but uh, well, the, the uh, people in laser fusion try to do uh, exactly what happened in, in a diesel and in, in, in a conventional uh, uh, engine, uh, to compress the, the pulse, compress the fuel, and at one point they were, they were sending a short pulse, very short pulse. And, but it didn't work. And why that? Because, of course, when with, the, with all these uh, the very long pulses, you are really producing a, a huge plasma around 
around uh, the target, which is shielding the target. So the visible pulse cannot penetrate. But now we know how to produce high peak power X-ray pulse. So we, I think we have to revisit this concept with this type of pulses because they will be able to penetrate uh, the plasma. And, and then, then maybe make fusion uh, possible. Okay, there was another question here in front. Mm, sorry. Then you must come closer to the mic. Uh, so I have a question in, uh, in, a, in a slightly different topic. Mm -hmm. So in CERN, in many, many experiments are searching for different kinds of photons, for example, dark photon. And mm -hmm. so while pursuing this, your passion for extreme light, do you personally see any motivation that why different kinds of uh, photons should exist? Oh, I mean, I know this, I, I, you know, this is one of the, we are talking about uh, Eli and, and so on, the infrastructures, and there is proposal really to look at dark matter and so on, using high intensity light. Yes. But I'm not involved with this. Yes, in the back there. I, yeah, so from what I understood, a major goal is to reach the Schwinger limit and to produce mm -hmm. pairs of electrons from, from light. So I wonder, once you reach that limit and you're able to do that, what types of things you would then study with that process? I, I guess the reason I ask is because at the LHC, um, we, can also prov we can also collide gamma rays from the charge fields around protons, but mm -hmm. they're virtual photons unlike the real photons from lasers. So I wondered if there was anything complementary that we could study that you plan to study once you reach this short mm -hmm. limit. Yeah. Uh, no, I think we can already study. Of course, I mean, you, you, can, you, can, produce, you can go to the Schwinger limit, certainly. Here, uh, yeah, there's no problem. But I mean, with a laser, that has never been done, of course. And <clears throat> so you have a way really to control, to control really uh, the field. Uh, very well, I think. So we can I study uh, the generations of this, uh, uh, the breakdown of vacuum, I think. We can time resolve it, you know, because if we have very short pulses, we, one can induce, you know, the breakdown and the other one can really probe it. So you, we could time resolve this in, uh, maybe in a septosecond regime, okay. Uh, this, I, I see that this possibility now coming up. And uh, so that's, that is very, very, of course, exciting. And of course, there's always this application, the possibility of trying to, um, to combine a technology, of course, you, I mean, accelerator technology with, uh, with laser technology to produce gamma, gamma, and things like this, you know. Please. One, one final comment. Since, since you made this, uh, this comment on fusion, you see, on the pressure with, with the fusion, I would like to draw your attention that we are at CERN in the R&D phase for the project, which, uh, which uh, for those two questions, like transportation of nuclear waste or, for example, the controlled fusion, would be much more close to reality with respect to the future application you see uh, that you have with your... I, 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 I missed the beginning of your question. You see, oh, the, the, your comments. About this is the comments, you see, that, yeah, 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 you yeah. See, that uh, in the real time I was comparing what you can get, you see, with your scheme of, of this uh, amplified uh, pulses mm -hmm. and, and going to short pulses with respect to what we can gain by uh, going through the R&D phase of the Gamma Factory project. Mm -hmm. yeah. in, in those two, uh, uh, you see, aspects that uh, since you mentioned them, mm -hmm. then I would like to make the, the comment that for everything that has to do with the controlled fusion in which you make pressure by external radiation, but also for transportation of nuclear waste, making gamma rays of extremely high intensity is the a process which macroscopically could give you much better handling, you see, 
a, a, for, for the processes which are not at microscopic level, but a, mm -hmm. in which you would go to grams or you see of the matter, or if you would like to a, make the controlled fusion by, by pressure of the a, mm -hmm. radiation. It's just to, a, to tell you that there is such a, pro a project which is in R&D phase. We are not there, you see, but a, a, there is a, yeah, a, a development going on. We, I mean, uh, it's called Gamma Factory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, gamma. Um, yeah, I don't deny this. It's just a fact that now of course, we are coming with new, new ways to maybe do that more easily and, and so on. You know. What is exciting is the fact that uh, we go, you know, we've, we start from the visible light, okay, femtosecond, and now we have the prospect to go to the atosecond and maybe the zeptosecond. And on the way, I'm sure things, applications are going to, to, uh, to come up. Uh, it, it's phenomenal for, for me because it, before uh, the laser was invisible, okay? Now we are really uh, going, you know, into, uh, it was EV physics. Now uh, we, we are seeing that it's going to MEV, GV, and maybe TEV physics. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? <coughs> if not, then let's uh, thank Gerard again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I was a little bit tired. Yeah, I was.